Vincent van Gogh said the greatest work of art is to love someone. When I think about love, I think about growing up in Montana, land of 100 mountain ranges. That always kind of amazes me. You know? And I think of the East Coast and how over half of the eastern seaboard can fit inside Montana. My mother grew up in Cohagen, Montana. So now think about New York City. Cohagen has eight people. <laughs> it gets cold in the winter. They've got a store. They've got the back of the house where she lived, which my grandmother was the postmaster out of, and they've got two bars. It's cold in the winter in Montana. <laughs> so I like to think about family, and I like to think about love, and I love that idea that Vincent van Gogh brought to us. The greatest work of art is to love someone. Let's hear some of our other major thought leaders around the world. Elizabeth Barrett Browning from a couple of centuries ago. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. From Shakespeare, love is not love which alters when it alteration finds, nor bends with the remover to remove. From Martin Luther King Jr., hate cannot cast out hate. Only love can do that. From Bell Hooks, the great feminist writer, it's all about love. So when I think about love, I think about these three daughters I have also, which does give me the opportunity to have no less than, I think it's 11 pink shirts now, and they like to pick them out, and we have a good time together. And when Ariana, my second daughter, when she was about four or five years old, I was coming out of the university that I work at, Gonzaga University, and I was coming out of one of the buildings, and I had her on top of my shoulders, and she starts singing, and she's singing at the top of her lungs. I mean, it is very loud. And about two blocks away, people coming out of other businesses are looking because they can hear this singing. It's that loud, right? And so I'm having fun. You know, I like it, I like it that she's singing, and we're walking along, and after a while, I'm like, hey, hey, what are you doing up there? And she says, I'm singing at the clouds. <laughs> and that reminds me of joy and what's worth fighting for in life. What are the things that are worth fighting for? And when you grow up in Montana, there's all kinds of wilderness around you, all kinds of mountains. And I like going back home to see my mom and my dad. And often when I get there, my dad will throw a newspaper on the table. And on that table and on the front of that newspaper will often be some type of... Uh, a bit hard picture to look at. Usually it'll be someone not from Montana that went to Yellowstone National Park, which is your, near Bozeman, and got gored by one of the animals in the park. And on this current picture, there was a man, and he had receding hairline, and he had a huge beard, and he had a lot of stitches kind of all over. And he's like, you'll like this one. So I'm reading this story. And he obviously got in a tussle, right? So what's the story behind him? And they, t they talked about it a little bit. He got kind of tired of the rat race of life, and he decided he would just go live in the mountains. Not a common decision, but maybe some of us would like to do that. But in any case, that's what he did. He's up there. Local ranching community knows of him, and he's not a danger to anybody. And he's just living out in the wilderness for a year and then two years. And, and, you know, he gets his supplies in town and comes back up. But in any case, at one point when he's in the high country, he's down on the ground and he's just looking at some vegetation. And we, when he looks up, there's a mother grizzly right in front of him. Bear jumps on top of him. And in most cases, the person's killed in that situation. This man got really aggressive, did something very intense, and did something to the bear's nose, and the bear ran away from him. Now, he's very cut up at this point bleeding profusely. He's got to go two miles to his truck. He gets there. He drives in his truck to the nearest ranch house. A woman, op he, he knocks on the door. A woman opens the door. She sees him, and she says, we got to get you to the hospital. And him being like many Northern European uh, white-oriented males says, I'm not going to the hospital. <laughs> and her, being a fierce Montana woman, you're going to the hospital. Get in my car right now. <laughs> Wraps his head in a towel. Takes him to the hospital. He gets there, he gets the thousands of stitches. He's all right, he lives. And the thing that struck me about the article was at the end, there's a female reporter that was interviewing him, and she said most people are killed in that situation when a, when a mother grizzly comes at them. What were you thinking in that moment? Here's what he said. I thought I'll fight until I die. For me, I probably would have thought I'll lay down until I get killed. But that man had something that we all need. And it can be applied in different situations. And when it comes to love, we need it these days. We need it. There's a balance between love and power. Martin Luther King said it best when he said, 
Power without love is reckless and abusive. And love without power is sentimental and anemic. I think we've all experienced that. He says, power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice, and justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. It comes to us again when we think about the greatest work of art is to love someone down in our families and how that begins to become something transcendent towards nation-to-nation relationships. But let's start with, with the house. My first daughter, Natalia, I came in. She's on the floor in the kitchen. I noticed that she's got a, a card that she's been making, basically, and it's, it's basically a white piece of paper folded in half, and it's got all these blue and yellow stars all over it, you know, crayon stars that she's made. So I sit down next to her. I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, I'm making a card for you. I'm like, oh, thank you. I sit down, put my arm around her. And uh, we're talking, and we open it up, and it says, you're my favorite daddy in the stars. And I'm kind of like, wow, that was nice, you know. And I tell her that, and, and I'm thinking, too, that's very creative. And so I say to her, I mean, how did you, how did you think of that? That's really, uh, that's really nice and really creative, what you said there. And she says, well, you know, I didn't know how to spell world. So what is the role of conflict and alienation and violence in the misled life? What, it, what is it these days? Let's go back three centuries. War-related deaths three centuries ago? Just think about what number that might have been. It was five million. Five million war-related deaths three centuries ago. Two centuries ago, 20 million. Now just consider the last century. Just think about it for a moment. What are the war-related deaths in the last century? 120 million. So we seem to try to convince ourselves that we're getting better, but maybe we're not. And there are some inner elements of our lives that are worthy of deep devotion. When you add in famine that is government-sponsored, think about that term, government-sponsored famine. That number goes from 120 up to 180 million. And then we think about individuals at at this point, right? You can attribute 23 million deaths to Hitler. You can attribute 27 million to Stalin. And you can attribute 50 million to Mao. So it becomes important. And when you think about, well, what does that mean for us? That's too big. It may not be too big. Right now we have a 50 to 70% divorce rate, depending on which figure you look at. Being a psychologist, I get the honor of working with so many beautiful people and how they try to come together. And what I notice is most of us have never been taught very many skills of how people's inner lives interact with one another and then what that might mean once we get angry or once we get harmed or once we've done damage to someone else or who we are with people. So I've also had the, the grace of being a forgiveness researcher for the last 20 years just to look at those interior elements and what that might mean to us as people. And you find some fascinating things. Right now, some of the best research in the world comes out of University of Washington. John Gottman, some of you would be familiar with his writing and his books. And it's fascinating. It's powerful to see what we've discovered. If you're a scientist or if you like social science at all, you know that if we get a bunch of you together, maybe two or 3,000 of you, and we test you on a few things, we'll get what's called a natural bell curve. Just like that, right? And people that are out here, one and two, st- three standard deviations away from the norm, when they started testing about how people relate, this looks way different than the people that are down here not relating very well. What, what does it look like? Down here, what it's called is negative sentiment override. Those relationships will be caught in negative sentiment override. What does negative sentiment override look like? The way researchers looked at that is they started to measure not just your behaviors, but your tone of voice, your eye contact, even what you're thinking about when you're inside a conflict. So people would come into what uh, Gottman called the love lab, and everything would be videotaped except for the bathroom for about a three to five day stretch. And then out of all these thousands of people analyzing thoughts and behaviors and attitudes and actions and inactions and the way that we are motivated and what our dreams are, how did they do that? They'd pull them out of the lab and look at the tape and say, when you, when you scream this at Sally, what, what, what was your thought process right there? You know? So they'd analyze even down to, and what was your motivation? What were you trying to, what were you trying to get you know, out of that? So anyway, you get negative sentiment override, which means imminent dissolution or, the re- or readiness to be disintegrated. Now, some of us can manage staying in that Im- imminent dissolution or disintegration, and somehow it, uh, it almost keeps us alive in a parasitic way, right? 
Some of us do break apart. Some of us stay in it. Then there's up here on the other side of the bell curve, and that's called positive sentiment override, and it is what you think. It's, it's basically five to ten positive interactions to every one negative interaction. It's measurable even. You know, down here is five to ten negative interactions to every one uh, positive interaction. And so Godman became pretty strong at, at understanding, well, what, is it, what does it look like? And he, he got to where he could predict divorce in three minutes at a 95% rate. At a 95% rate within the next three years. What it was was contempt on the face of a person three times over the course of about 45 seconds. Contempt is what you think it is. <laughs> it is, I hate you, right? And so you can see how some of these things begin to interact. Now, what does it mean? It gets even scarier from there. 80% of men who divorce, and we, all, we need to understand, too, that we're all made up of masculine and feminine. We all have masculine and feminine within us. Some of us block our feminine to the detriment of society. Some of us block our, our masculine to the detriment of society. There's a quality ma masculine, a life-affirming masculine, a quality and, and life-deepening feminine. And when we block that, it harms us and harms others, right? Eighty percent of men who divorce, I'll share one thing. Kind of a nice thing to know. My wife would really like me to know that and not do it. And uh, eighty percent of women who divorce, I'll share one thing, or people that have masculine as their majority or feminine as their majority, right? So when we look at it, what is it? The eighty percent of men who divorce, what they share, they don't receive the influence of the feminine. They put a wall up instead of receiving the influence of the feminine. 80% of women who divorce, what they share, they have contempt for the masculine. They have hatred for the masculine. What can be done about that type of thing? There are many beautiful things that can be done about that type of thing. When I first experienced the core of it, it came down to me as forgiveness. And not just forgiveness, but something below that. I think most of us don't necessarily think about forgiveness a lot. And when we do, we might think, well, maybe I need to forgive that person, you know. It's a hard thing to think about. On a deeper level, when we get to stronger, more mature areas of life, we think, I think I need to ask forgiveness, and I think I need to make atonement. But I had never been exposed to that myself until I met my future wife's father-in-law. It took me forever to get up the courage to ask Jennifer for a date in the first place. And then she had the gall to say something like, sure, I'd love to, but first you have to have an interview with my father. I played college basketball, played basketball overseas, and he was a very intense coach. Think of Bobby Knight. I was not looking forward to that interview. And I tried to argue her, argue her out of the interview. No, not really. She, yeah, yeah, that's what we do. No, come, seriously? Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, she was an amazing person. I really wanted to date her. <laughs> so anyway, I did surrender into the interview. I get to their house, and you got to remember culture too, right? My family culture is Czech and German. The, the parents' bedroom, somewhat of a relic zone. Don't go in there. Don't touch anything. <laughs> Jennifer's family, Irish background. The parents' bedroom, it's where everybody gathers at the end of the day, hangs out, talks, says a prayer, goes off to their beds, right? I didn't know that. Get to the door. Her dad greets me, and he says, come with me. Up the stairs into the parents' bedroom. <laughs> and when I get in there, I am at odds with life, right? So <laughs> I get in there. There's two chairs set up way too close to each other. Way too close. So with my Czech German hand, I move my chair back quite a bit, right? And uh, I sit down. That's when everything changed. This person that was a very intense basketball coach had a heart of strength and beauty and depth and intimacy, right? And it touches me thinking about it. He started with, here's some of the things I love about you that I've noticed about you. And that was the first time I'd heard an adult male talk like that directly to me. Right? That was maybe, he said, seven, eight things. Right? Then he went into, here's some of the things I love about your mom. Then he went into, here's some of the things I love about your dad. When we think about our inner violence, we need people that are ready to heal us, right? He said, I'd give you 50 rules, but you wouldn't remember all those. So I'll give you two, you'll remember those. And I was right. He said, 
One of them is uh, Jennifer knows her limitations. Don't take, don't take her beyond those. And the second one is, I don't want you to have to come to me and say you're sorry. So these are kind of big guru rules. <laughs> what do they mean even? You know, I mean, they mean something like you better be a decent or good person. <laughs> but still, even those would just drop out the bottom if that person didn't pursue relationship in an enduring way with me, which he did. Over the next few years, it was probably over 100 times that he would say, I got this day trip, I'm speaking down at the Tri-Cities to this high school, and uh, why don't you come with me? You know? and so we'd go on all these journeys. And he was just a great relater, incredible conversationalist, humble, ready to grow, fully embracing of the feminine, never negating the feminine, understanding the masculine, knowing how to live. So that was, a, that was a great moment in my life to receive that from him. And the first time I heard about forgiveness asking came from him. He had made a sharp, sharp comment at the dinner table to his wife. I didn't even pick up the sharp comment because on a 100-point scale of verbal violence, that was a minus 8 in my family. <laughs> and uh, so I was like, wow, that was nice. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Anyway, I'm over sitting on the couch a little bit later. And he comes over and sits next to me, and he says, I'd like to ask your forgiveness for the way I treated my wife at the dinner table. And I didn't know what to do. I'm like, ah, uh, you don't have to ask me. And uh, he says, no, I don't ask just for you. I mean, in, in our family, we ask forgiveness of the person that we harmed and also everybody else that was there in order to restore the dignity of the one that was harmed. That moment with the investment into my life changed me entirely. Forgiveness research is profound around the world right now. People with higher forgiveness capacity have lower depression. They have lower anxiety. They have less heart disease. Think of that symbolically. They have less heart disease. Right? They have greater emotional well-being, and bridges are being made to stronger immune systems. The Mayo Clinic uses forgiveness in its treatment process now. The DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Disorders, which us psychologists use to help give people diagnoses, the next one that comes out will have bitterness as a personality disorder based on that research. So when we think about it, what does it take for us to come to a close place with each other? If the greatest work of art is to love one another, how do we move in that direction? Martin Luther King gave it to us. The, the oppressor will not willingly give up power. So don't be blind or dumb about it. If you're getting wrong, that's not just going to change. Right? But then he gives us the second moment of illumination and brilliance when he says, when we love the oppressor, we bring about not only our own salvation, but the salvation of the oppressor. He, he is noticing that we all oppress and that it's up to us to come to a deeper place with one another. I think of my grandfather in closing, and he lived a, a life in which we loved him, but then he descended all the way into alcohol, and he died young. He was a lovely person, but he ended up dying in state-funded housing in Montana with nobody near him. And it was what I would call one of the family's most disheartening moments. I pair that with a moment with my Isabella, who's my third daughter, when she was about four, and she's at the kitchen table, and I look at her, and she's eating, and I see how beautiful she is, and I look into her eyes, and I say, why do I love you so much? Why do I love you so much? She just keeps chewing like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. So I kind of get more serious with her, grab her face. Why do I love you so much? Her answer, because you were made to love me. Thank you.